Hi guys, welcome back to the Swing Guitar Blog. My name is Jonathan Stout, and we have another New Guitar Day post for you. Um, it's a little late. This is uh, probably, I've had this for a couple weeks now. But this is a 1932 Epiphone Deluxe. Um, it is some kind of prototype or something because there are no other ones uh, like this as far as the cosmetics. Um, the guitar was originally sold, at least in the modern era, at archtop.com to my friend Ted. Um, so Joe Vinico did a great job of sort of documenting the guitar uh, and his archives still show it so you can I can put post the link um, Ted played it a bunch but he's mostly a gypsy jazz guy and so was finding that he really didn't play this guitar nearly as much as he should and got rid of it he sold it to Lark Street Music where I found it um, because I've been looking for um, a sort of whatever the guitar is and um, having gotten a uh, advanced model 17 inch X braced 30s Gibson uh, I have found that that is not the guitar it's an awesome guitar and it's a very different animal um, but as I'll talk about it's sort of not the thing that I need most of the time um, I'm gonna definitely gonna keep it for a long time because it's it's really good um, but I needed I needed something different uh, so my thought was uh, some kind of walnut backed Broadway uh, Epiphone uh, maybe I mean I was really hoping for a, a 20s Gibson L5 sort of from the get-go but I also knew enough to know that um, it really depends on on the guitar um, and you know there can be crappy models of any kind and and I, I was kind of hoping that maybe I wouldn't have to only get that and that maybe there would be something else um, I was sort of looking at a like a uh, 41 L7 uh, that I still feel like maybe I should have got to, um, but that which which would have been um, parallel braced. But um, what I found was I was you know looking for Epiphones. Um, I just found this one and and on Lark Street's website. So uh, it, I, I immediately recognized it as my friend Ted's guitar. So I called him up and he said, "Look, this is this is what you're looking for." Um, and I sort of described what I was experiencing, and he said, "No, no, this is." This is the guitar you want, and and just trust me and go with it. Um, funnily enough, when I got it, I hated it, and it was because I was so used to the L12 that I was really comparing apples to oranges, and, and I just, you know, in hindsight, I was just saying this apple is such a crappy orange. I don't understand, and that's because it's an apple. It's not supposed to be an orange. Um, the L12 is very definitively what a 30s X braced advanced Gibson should be. Uh, it's got a huge bottom end, uh, it's really full, it's really uh, balanced, and it's got a really nice high end. Um, and it just speaks the minute you touch it. It is not a beater guitar though. It does not respond well to being throttled. It responds well to just playing lightly. And it speaks very, very quickly. Um, and it's just, it's, it's feather light, which is great. Um, but like I said, like, it, I, what I found is on, on gigs with a bigger band, and not even with a a big band I mean literally going from a solo guitar situation or like maybe even like a trio uh, upsizing to a like a seven piece band with a full four piece rhythm section as soon as I added bass and guitar or sorry bass and drums it just sort of disappeared and uh, it wasn't because it wasn't mic'd well or because the wasn't monitored well it literally just those the, those frequencies it does not emphasize and those are the only frequencies that where something can get through and it's sort of like a New York City sub, uh, New York City sidewalk. You know, you can't walk three or four people across just down a busy New York City uh, sidewalk. It does not work. You will bump into people on either end. Uh, but one person can very effectively get through and not bump into people. Um, so, uh, you know, cutting through like a knife like that, that's really what this guitar does. And that's not necessarily something that by itself sounds as pretty and just how beautiful the l12 sounds it really didn't prepare me for when this came this does have sort of a nasal bark to it um and again i kept comparing apples to, to oranges um i have been able to use this on a couple of gigs now uh, i took it with me to new york to do uh, lincoln center's midsummer night swing with our big band uh, and i and we we also went to beantown which is a, a swing camp in boston um and I took this with me to a couple guitar shops um, where I played a bunch of really, really great, great guitars. 
um, several uh, uh, 20s or, or, or I guess 30s L10s, which theoretically are very, very, very close to an L, a 20s L5. Um, at least one D'Angelico and at least one D'Aquisto. Um, uh, a couple of really great L7s um, and, and at least one decent Epiphone. Um, but you know what I found is this thing really totally kept pace with all of them, uh, sounded awesome, and I just, I kept having expectations of what it was supposed to sound like that were not based in reality or not based in what actually sounds good. And the more that I played it, the more that I started to understand it, and um, the, real, the real deal ceiling uh, was, because um, I was gonna send this guitar back. I literally told the guy at Lark Street, you know, when it came time to the end of the, 48 hours he gave me. I said, yeah, I'm going to send it back. And he said, all right, that's fine. Um, and then when I didn't send it back, you know, he calls like, so are you sending it back or not? And I said, no, I changed my mind. Uh, but, but even after that, it still, there was still a little bit of like, oh, I don't know, maybe. Um, but I was on a gig this weekend and uh, sort of an odd gig where all of our drummers are out of town. So I ended up playing drums, but I also needed to do um, an hour of solo guitar before the band started. So I did an hour of solo guitar um, out on the patio um, on the L12, which sounded amazing. And uh, our sax player, Albert, came out and joined me for a little bit. And again, sounded amazing as a duo. Um, just just great. Really plays to that guitar's strengths. Um, when we were done with that, we went inside. I, I got behind the drum set. And it just so happened that our friend Craig Gildner uh, from DC uh, happened to be in town on vacation, and so I'd asked him maybe he could cover my chair because um, there are very few people that I, I think do both acoustic and electric guitar sort of the way I like to, and he's he definitely uh, was a great fill-in. So I got to hear both this guitar and the L12 in the context of a band, not playing it myself, and exactly what I'm saying is what exactly what I observed. This guitar cut through in that 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 little frequency notch right in the middle, just punching through that, that peak. And it was really concentrated on the G and G string. So that just really cut through the whole band. And when you switch to the L12, it, it just it just sort of disappears. And it, it really just, it's like it's gone. Because um, all of the bass just interferes with the bass and it doesn't really hold its own role in the, in the context of the band. Um, yeah, so that, that was mind blowing. Um, I've been really impressed with the intonation on this. It's, it's really, really fantastic. Um, the thing that's the scariest about this guitar is that it does not have an adjustable truss rod. Epiphone didn't introduce those till 37, although Gibson had them uh, you know, starting in the 20s. And so the fact that it's not adjustable is a little scary, um, but the neck is, is, is great. The action is fantastic. Um, this, was, this guitar was also another example of where I tried to throw on heavier strings and it just was not having it. Uh, so I had thrown on, it, it came with, uh, exactly what I like, which is a set of, of 13 or 12s with uh, a, a 13 and a 17 on top, or at least that's what I've settled on. Um, that was a similar thing with the L12, where the L12 really did not benefit from having heavier strings. It really just wanted to sing and not be throttled. Um, so it came with, with that same set on this one, and I tried going up to 13s with a 14 and an 18, and again, the guitar just was not having it. Um, and it was just a lot harder to play. The longer scale definitely fed into that. Um, so when I went back down to 12s with a 13 and a 17 swapped out, um, it really just came alive again. And that's what I've kept ever since. And you know, the guitar is not hurting for projection. And so um, I still believe that you need to give a guitar sufficient, um, sufficient tension on the top to really get it to, to drive the top but there's a point of diminishing returns. And so there's always a sweet spot. And it's the same thing with the action. The action needs to be high enough that the guitar is driven. But once you get there, like stop. There's no, there's no, you know, more is not more at that point. Um, anyway, uh, it's really great to play chord melody on. It cuts through a band better when I do play chord melody. Craig uh, plays fantastic chord melody guitar. So um, while we were on his wedding, he did a bunch of that. And it was amazing how much it punched through uh, very much like Alan Roos, where you can really hear it when he does it. Uh, and again, the rhythm work is great. Playing solos on it is fantastic. Um, dumb logistical things. The um, 
clipping the, the lavalier mic onto the tail piece like I have been, uh, it works great. And the tail piece is just high enough that there's a nice spot to grab onto. So that's definitely good. It's interestingly, it does have a bone nut, or sorry, not a bone nut, but a bone insert on the bridge, which is sort of an unusual thing. Uh, I don't know that I like that, but it's not like I'm gonna change out the original bridge at this point. I mean, it's from 1932. Um, the only thing the guitar kind of needs uh, repair work wise is the radius is good, but the D and G strings are a little low. So they're sort of, you know, if you curve following the neck, they're just a little bit kind of dipped down. Um, and that will add to the projection as well, just having them up slightly because they won't, they won't uh, buzz a little, uh, a bit. Anyway, uh, let me play it for you a bit and you can see what it's like. <laughs> tonight um, uh, uh, chord melody solo um, <laughs> so good um, and I actually so the funny thing is I think Alan Roos probably played that solo um, based on pictures that I, I can tell on a 34 deluxe that was probably just like this one at least as far as the um, uh, makeup of it uh, it also probably had a white guard because he's in the uh, 1936 clip of I can't remember what movie it's from, but Benny Goodman Band does uh, View Call Rag. He's definitely playing a white pickguarded uh, Epiphone. Um, and it looks like he's playing, uh, I know he got a 37 Deluxe um, that had a Frequencator on it. Before uh, early, late 37, early 38, he switched to Gibson. Um, but I do have a photo of his 17 inch uh, Deluxe that he was playing. Uh, with the frequencer, um, and then I, I've definitely, like I said, I've seen those clips where he's, he's clearly playing a, a, a white pick guarded Epiphone, um, and that only would have been a 34 theoretically. Um, so that that gives me hope that this is sort of what I've been looking for. Um, what else can I play for you? Um,
anyway, um, I'm sure I'll be telling you all about my uh, experiments with this and uh, see how it's going. Um, but uh, definitely check back in with us next time at the Swing Guitar Blog. I'm Jonathan Stout, and I'll see you next time.